Uh, welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Today, uh, we are excited to have Malus Marthaus from ETH Zurich talk about total causal effect estimation by combining co causal structure learning and covariate adjustment. Uh, this is a uh, joint work with, uh, with many people. Uh, two of them are with us today, Emma Perkovich from the University of Washington in Seattle and Leonard Henkel, who is a PhD student of Malus. So if you have uh, any questions, please uh, feel free to put them in Q&A. Uh, Malus will also stop from time to time uh, so, and, and allow for questions from the audience. All right, after the talk, we will have a discussion by Daniel Melinsky from Columbia. And then if we have some more time, we're going to allow more questions. All right. Thanks for joining. That's for it for me for now. I'm now switching over to Guillaume, who will handle the questions. All right. Thanks, Dominic. So uh, as Dominic mentioned, we are fortunate to have uh, Emma and uh, Leonard today with us. So please do ask your questions uh, through the Q&A. Uh, as usual, we will select a few of them and ask them to uh, Malus when she pauses. Uh, so, uh, if your question is selected, I will ask you to raise your hand um, and then I will unmute you. So, please do not raise your hand um, unless I've asked you to do so. All right, thank you very much. And Marlus, whenever you're ready. Thank you. So, let me share my screen. Okay, does this work? Yes, great. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and also for, uh, for putting together this, uh, this great seminar series. So I will start by, um, by a motivating example um, where we have uh, observational gene expression data from a model plant, Arabidopsis thaliana. And we have here 188 uh, samples and we measured uh, PS33 genes. Or we, this is not we, we were using these data, right? But, um, and the goal is now to estimate total effects between gene pairs. Um, so um, we wanna know if we would modify one gene, what would be the effect on, on another gene? So from a high level, we wanna go from observational data to total causal effect. Well, first then I need to define uh, what kind of definition of total effect I, I take and I will use the do operator. So do uh, big X is a little X or, or, or simply do X is a mathematical notation for a, for a hypothetical intervention where you set the variables in the set X to their value little X. And um, Using this notation, you can think about post-intervention densities where, uh, for example, the post-intervention density of Y given do X would be the intervention, the density of Y after uh, an intervention on these nodes in X. And the total causal effect is now defined in this interventional way. It's defined as a functional of this post-intervention density. So uh, what we will what I will use in this talk is um, that I look at the expected value of y given do x and then take the derivative with respect to x, right? So if, if the mean of y does not change at all, if I change my value little x, well, then x has no effect on y. But if little changes in this value x, where I put my, uh, my variable big X, I set to this uh, value little X. And if I change this value little X a little bit, and that will change a lot this expected value of Y, then we say there is a large causal effect. Okay, so, so we wanna go from observational data to total causal effects. And you can also think of that as going from an observational density. Uh, so this F of V is the, the joint density of your observed variables. And from there, we want to somehow get at this post-intervention density so that we can uh, get at our causal effect. But now the problem is, is that these uh, densities live kind of in different worlds, right? The one on the left is uh, in the observational world. And the one on the right is in this post-intervention world where we have changed the system and, and made this intervention on X. So in a sense, we need to kind of extrapolate from the observational world to an unseen interventional world. And you cannot do that without uh, some assumptions. So we need some causal assumptions in order to do this. 
and uh, I will assume that, um, that the data are generated from a directed acyclic graph or a DAG. And um, we can then connect the density F to uh, a causal DAG D in the following way. So we say that F is compatible to this causal DAG D if the joint density um, of all the variables factorizes uh, as the product of the conditional density of each node given its parents in the graph. Uh, but also more importantly, perhaps, uh, we know how interventional densities look like because for any intervention set X that I, that I may want to intervene on, the post-intervention density of the remaining nodes after this intervention on X is given by this truncated factorization formula. So what does this mean? This means we, all the conditional densities that correspond to nodes where we didn't intervene, they remain exactly the same. And the one where we intervened, they are, op they are uh, omitted. And this is a so-called kind of autonomy or invariance assumption that, that these conditional densities where you don't intervene do not change. And this allows us to go from to write a post-intervention density on the left side in this unseen world in terms of observational densities on the right-hand side. Okay, so now I said in the title of this talk that I was gonna combine uh, causal structure learning and covariate adjustment. So I first need to discuss these two building blocks now. I will uh, first discuss covariate adjustment when a DAG is known. And then I will uh, discuss some causal structure learning methods and then put these two together. Okay, so when we do covariate adjustment, then the post-intervention density of Y given do X can be written in a, in a particular form given here on the right-hand side, where we take the density of Y given X and S and the marginal density of S, and then we integrate out over S. So it's again on the left-hand side, we have this post-intervention density that we want to find. And on the right-hand side, we have only observational densities, but we now have them in this particular form. And we say that S, a, a set of variables S is a valid adjustment set for XY. So for the effect of X on Y in a causal DAG D, if for any density F that is compatible with this DAG D, this formula holds. And why, why am I interested in this formula? Because this is not the only way to identify causal effects, right? We had a, a formula here, actually, that when the DAG is known, uh, it identifies any causal effect that you may be interested in. We look at this, this kind of uh, limited type of identification in a sense. So we look at a subset, right, of, of identifiable effects, namely those that are identifiable in, in this particular way. And we do that because covariate adjustment is often used in practice and it simplifies in, in certain settings. So two things that are, for example, nice, if you think of a singleton X and a singleton Y variable, and Y is not a direct cause of X, so Y is not a parent of X, then the parents of X always satisfy this formula. So the parents of X always are a valid adjustment set. And if you have a linear system, then this total effect that I defined before can be obtained by doing a simple uh, regression. So you regress Y on X and this adjustment set S, and then you look at the coefficient of X, and that gives you the causal effect. So, uh, so it's a very uh, easy way to get at causal effects, for example, in linear systems. Uh, and therefore we, we decided to, to focus on this. So here is an example where, where we see this in practice. So here I have drawn uh, a DAG and you can think of this DAG as the generating, as just representing the generating mechanism of the variables. And I've made this explicit by, uh, by really writing down the R code. So I have a large sample size, N is 100,000. And then these variables Z1, Z2, Z4, and Z7, they don't have any parents and I just generate them as standard Gaussian noise. I, they don't, here I took them all to have a variance one, but that's not necessary, uh, just uh, to, to make it simple. 
And now every variable is generated as a linear function of its parents and some additive noise. So for example, X has two parents, Z1 and Z2, and I generated as Z1 plus Z2 plus some other noise. And um, you can think of this, of these edges as having weights. And here these edges, they have, they have weight one because I take one times Z1 and one times Z2, and therefore I did not write them in the graph. But for example, if we look at Z5, then I generate it as 0.8 times X plus Z4 plus some random noise, right? So you can really generate the variables according to this DAG. And you can then also think of do interventions as just replacing one of these generating mechanisms. So if I do a do intervention on X, then it would mean that I no longer generate X as a function of Z1 and Z2, but I set it to some value that I determine. Okay, well, in this uh, graph, we have only one directed path from X to Y, and it's a linear system. And the edge weights here are 0.8 and 2. And this means in order to get the causal effect of X on Y, I can just multiply these edge weights. And I know that the causal effect of X on Y will be 1.6 in this case. So now we can do some adjusted regressions with different adjustment sets and see uh, if we recover this effect. So that's what I've done here. So each time I regress Y on X and some other variables. So this would be the, the set bold S from the, from the slides before. And first I take the parents of X because we, I said that this is always valid, right? And indeed we see that if we do this regression and I now look at the coefficient of X and that's the, that's the second coefficient because the first one is the intercept, then indeed we see that we recover 1.6. Uh, quite precisely. So using the parent sets indeed seems to work, but the parent set is not the only set that works. So what else can we do? Well, we can try the empty set, not do any adjustment at all, just regress Y on X. And then we see that we uh, are off by quite a bit. And that's not so surprising because we have a confounding variable Z2 between X and Y, right? That we should adjust for. Then you can think, well, if I take Z2, maybe I add Z3, is that okay or not? So if I do that, then you see that, yes, that's allowed. So Z3 is a child of X and I can add it to my adjustment set without doing any uh, damage. Can I maybe also use Z2 and Z6, right? And there we see that suddenly things go wrong. Uh, so we get an estimate of about 0.5 rather than 1.6. So adding Z6 into this adjustment set uh, is not okay. And this set Z2 and Z6 is not a valid adjustment set. And if I, for example, add Z, if I have Z2, Z4 and Z7, then that's fine. And I can, uh, I get a good estimate of 1.6 again. So, so how can we read from this DAG what sets we can use for adjustment? And this was uh, developed by um, Spitzer et al. and also by Perkovich uh, et al. So Emma and me and others. Um, and um, there we uh, uh, showed that um, that adjustment sets uh, in a DAG for for x y must satisfy these two conditions, and that this characterizes all valid adjustment sets. And what are these conditions? Well, this adjustment set Z may not contain any descendants of any node W that's not in X that lies on a proper causal path from X to Y. So, so this, this word proper here is, is needed if, if X is a, is a set. So if you do a joint intervention on, on several variables at once. So maybe we just think of a single intervention for now and then you can uh, forget the proper. So the call, a causal path, by that we just mean a directed path from X to Y. So in this graph, there is only one directed path from X to Y, namely X, Z5 and Y. And we cannot have descendants of Z5 and of Y in our adjustment set. And by we use the convention that every node is also a descendant of itself. So this means that we cannot have Z5, Z6, Y, and Z8. And I made them red to indicate that these are forbidden nodes that we cannot use. 
And then the second condition is, is that Z must block all proper non-causal paths from X to Y in G. And a non-causal path is just any path that is not directed from X to Y. So in this case, we have only one that passes through Z2. And the only way to block it is to use Z2 in the adjustment set. So it then follows that the valid adjustment sets are of the following form. You need to have Z2. And then you can add any of these black nodes, Z1, Z3, Z4, and Z7. But you don't have to. These are optional. And the red nodes are forbidden. And then we indeed see that, that well, the parent set was valid. Z1 and Z2 satisfies this, uh, these conditions here. Z2 and Z3 is also valid. But we see, for example, that Z2 and Z6 are, is not valid because Z6 is such a red node. OK, so this is adjustment for DAX. But now, what do we do if the DAG is unknown? Or maybe, shall I pause quickly here already, or um, shall I continue? Um, there's been a couple questions so far, but I think um, Emma and Leonard are working on them. So um, yeah, maybe we'll raise them up at the next stop. OK, OK, perfect. Thank you. So then I will continue. So, so what do we do now if the DAG is unknown? Well, then um, a DAG encodes these separation relationships, right? And, but the, so you, and these separations kind of correspond to conditional independencies in the distribution. So you could think, well, I use conditional independencies in the distribution to find the DAG. And this kind of works, but not quite, because several DAGs can encode the same de-separation relationships, and they form this Markov equivalence class. So here is one of the simplest examples. Uh, you have here x1, x2, and x3. And in all of these, you have, for example, that x1 and x3 are de-separated by x2, this middle node. Um, and, and x1 and x3 are not de-separated by the empty set, etc. So these form a Markov equivalence class, and it will be, uh, it is generally hard to distinguish which graph from a Markov equivalence class generated your data. So sometimes you can do this if you put some additional assumptions or constraints, but in, in general, uh, it, it will be difficult. So a Markov equivalence class can be described uniquely by, uh, by another graph, which is called the CP deck. And for the example above, the CP deck looks like this. It just had x1, x2, and x3. And then there is a, an edge between x1 and x2 and x2 and x3, where I put circles at the, at the endpoints of the edges to indicate that we don't know in which direction the edge goes. And now the nice thing is that the, such a CP deck is identifiable from observational data under some assumptions. And there is a lot of work on that. So an assumption that's often made is that, that the observational distribution F is Markov and faithful to the causal DAG. And that implies then that all the D separations in the DAG exactly correspond to conditional independencies in the distribution. And this can be leveraged. For example, the, the constraint-based methods uh, use this in the following ways that they, they test conditional independencies in the data. And from that, they kind of reverse engineer back how the DAG looks like or how the Markov equivalence class of DAGs looks like. And a prominent example of this uh, type of method is the PC algorithm by Spertis et al. And this algorithm was shown to be consistent in high dimensional settings by Kalish and Buhlmann. And with Diego Colombo, um, we made an order independent version that is a bit more stable in, in high dimensional settings. Then there's another branch of methods which are score based where you uh, basically search over the space of DAGs and CP DAGs, DAGs or CP DAGs, and then you uh, want to optimize a certain score function. For example, a penalized likelihood uh, score. And uh, an example of this is greedy equivalent search by Chickering. Uh, and Chickering showed that this is consistent uh, in, the, in, the, in the limit, even though it is a, a greedy search method. And uh, with Pritam Nandi, we showed that, that we can also obtain consistency in high dimensional settings uh, under some conditions. And then there is also 
hybrid methods that, that combine ideas of both constraint-based and score-based methods. But all of these typically give you a, a CP deck as output. So how can we then put these parts together? Well, one kind of very straightforward way to do this is to start with your observational data, apply the PC algorithm or GES or, or a hybrid algorithm or whatever you like. But we started with PC because when we started this, we, we only had consistency of the PC algorithm. But OK, so you apply a causal structure learning method with some, some theoretical guarantees, and then you get an, an estimated CP DAG. And now conceptually, you can just list all the DAGs that are described by the CP DAG. So all the DAGs in this Markov equivalence class. And then asymptotically, one of these DAGs must have generated your data, but you don't know which one. But what you can do is you can just say, well, if it were the first one, I can determine the parent set of X and I can do adjusted regression to get the effect of X on Y if the first DAG was the true one. And I can do the same for the second DAG and, and for all of these, right? And I get in that way, a multi-set of uh, possible causal effects. And again, asymptotically, uh, the right, uh, the, the true causal effect will be, um, uh, estimated by one member of this multiset. So now you can wonder why do we use the parent set here for adjustment? And then part of that is, well, the main reason is basically historical that when we started this, we did not know much about causality yet. And we just knew that the parents always satisfy the backdoor criterion. Um, what we also liked about the parent set is that, um, that you can bypass this, this, um, this listing of all the DAGs in the equivalence class, because this can be infeasible if you, for large systems. And we then showed, because the parent of X is such a local set, that you can read them off with a local method directly from the CP DAG. So you, you don't have to actually list all these DAGs in the equivalence class. You can just read off possible parent sets directly from the CP DAG and then do your adjusted regressions. Um, so, so that is a, a nice advantage that makes it computationally uh, efficient to do this. Um, we will see that it also has some disadvantages, namely in terms of um, precision of our estimates. Uh, but we will get to that later. So then once we have this multiset, we can summarize it in, in any way that you like, basically. Um, to summarize this information. You, so you can use the minimum and the maximum value to get a bound on, cause, on your true causal effect. And what we will often do is that we take the minimum absolute value of all these estimates, because that is a lower bound on the size of the true causal effect. Okay, so we have a consistency result in high dimensional settings of this method, and we have an extension to, to joint intervention. So if you, don't think of knocking out uh, one gene at a time and, and uh, predicting the effect of that, but maybe knocking out two or three genes at once. Um, and uh, we also have an extension to CP DAGs with background knowledge. So sometimes you can um, basically either by, by background knowledge that you directly put in or by um, certain algorithms obtain smaller classes than the Markov equivalence class. And uh, we can also use this IDA method uh, in those settings. Okay, so now what if we have hidden variables? Well, there are also causal, causal structure learning methods that allow for arbitrarily many hiddens. And some examples are FCI, RFCI, and FCI plus. So it all kind of variations of this FCI algorithm. And the output of the FCI algorithm is a bit more complicated. It's a Markov equivalence class of maximal ancestral graphs. And uh, Daniel Malinsky and Peter Spurtis, uh, they extended this IDA idea to, to this setting. So they uh, use FCI to estimate the Markov equivalence class of max, and then they use adjustment at the mag level. Then as we will see later, this method can be uh, somewhat conservative. 
And that is not so surprising if you see that it allows arbitrarily many hidden variables, right? So, so this assumption is, is very weak. So as a kind of a middle ground option between assuming no hiddens or arbitrarily many hiddens, we then also developed a method where we impose a condition on the hiddens in a sense that we allow a few hidden variables that affect many of the observed ones. So this can, for example, um, represent batch effects or, or certain common confounders that, uh, that affect your data. And if you have such a particular structure, then the precision matrix uh, of your data has a low rank plus sparse structure. And where the low rank comes from the hiddens and the sparse structure comes basically from the underlying DAG. And uh, you can then use a low rank plus sparse decomposition like Chandra Sekharan et al did for, for Gaussian graphical models to uh, estimate this, this uh, low rank part coming from the hiddens. And in that way, you can kind of get a cleaned up version of your covariance matrix where the effect of the hiddens is removed. And then you can put that covariance matrix into any causal structure learning method that you like. So we combined it here with the GES uh, method. And the output then will be a CP DAC. Uh, so you can just use this as a first step uh, in the plain IDA method. And here, now I would like to show you some results of, of how this then works in practice. So we go back to this uh, gene expression data of this Arabidopsis thaliana. And um, I want to mention now that there were three groups of genes uh, in these data. There were some genes coming from, from a so-called MVA pathway, some coming from the MEP pathway, and some mitochondrial genes. So we did not use this information when we uh, applied the method, but the genes are ordered in that way. So the ones from the MEP pathway are first, and then the mitochondrial ones are in the middle, and then the MVA pathway is third. Okay, so, so what do we see here? So we see the, these genes on uh, both axes. And so for every pair of genes, so every little box here correspond to a pair of genes. And um, we visualize here with a grayscale this minimum absolute value of this multiset that we estimated for that particular gene pair. So the darker this is, the more we believe there is a causal effect between these genes. And you see that if we assume no latent, no hidden variables, so we do uh, IDA where we use GES in the first step, then we get a lot of gray. So we, we estimate causal effects uh, for, for many, many pairs. If we use the LVIDA approach, um, then we see that it's very conservative and we, and we find only three gene pairs where we get uh, a non-trivial lower bound. In all the other cases, the lower bound is, is zero or, um, or the effect is unidentifiable. So we also don't get a, get a bound. And then this low rank plus sparse GES IDA version. So that's the one where we uh, allow a few hiddens that affect many of the observed ones. That uh, is somewhat in the middle between these two. And, and what we see is we see a little bit of a white cross. And that kind of means here that these mitochondrial genes seem to have little to do with the genes of these other pathways. Now, I don't know enough about the biology to really know if this is sensible or not, and we don't have a ground truth, but we were happy that we kind of found this structure that, uh, that at least doesn't seem biologically fully implausible. Um, and we can also, in this method, kind of interpret this, um, this latent confounder that, that we find. And, and in this case, uh, we found that it seems to represent the, the pathway information. Okay, so this is a good point to stop for me. So what I showed so far is we, we start with observational data. We use some causal structure learning method to get a CP deck or a pack, so, so a, a class of, of causal graphs that, or that represent a class of causal graphs. And then we use this IDA method to get a multi-set of causal effects out. And what I will do next is that we will think about whether we can use adjustment directly at the level of the CP deck or the pack 
for effects that are identifiable by adjustment uh, at this level. But first I will pause to see if there are any questions. All right, thanks, Marlis. Yes, there's a lot of questions. Uh, Leonard and Emma are doing a great job in the Q&A. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just um, pick one. So um, this one was uh, is asked by um, uh, Dev, which um, I think you should be Hi. unmuted now. You can ask your question. Hi, my question was whether these adjustment sets that you described in the theorem could be identified efficiently computationally, uh, perhaps uh, or a minimal such set, can it be identified efficiently computationally? Yes, yes, so that's a very good question. Uh, yes, this can be, I don't, I don't know, uh, efficiently is of course always a kind of a, a matter of taste, but uh, yes, we do have actually uh, software in the PCL R package and also in the Degety R package, which is maintained by Johannes Texter. Uh, where we can find for a given deck, we can find all valid adjustment sets or for any pair of X, Y that you're interested in, we can quickly say if there's any valid adjustment set at all, or if you have a pair X, Y, Z, when you wanna know if Z is a valid adjustment set for X and Y, you can put that in and we can quickly tell you yes or no. So, um, so yes, we can do this. And, and then you also asked about minimal adjustment sets. So, I'm not 100% sure if we have that implemented. I think we may have. Um, but later, I will also talk a little bit about efficiency. And then we'll, of course, minimal adjustment sets have the advantage that you need to measure only few variables. Uh, so if it's expensive to measure variables, then, then uh, it's a good thing to, to work with small adjustment sets. They are not always the most efficient ones in terms of statistical precision, as we will see later. Um. Thank you, Marius. Uh, one related question uh, was about the, the size uh, that can be handled, um, like the number of variables that can be mm -hmm. uh, kind of realistically handled by the, by, by the method computationally. Yeah, so we can, we have done a few thousand variables, but this depends also a little bit on, so these causal structure learning methods, they have tuning parameters. So for example, the PC algorithm has this uh, significance level or this, this alpha level. Uh, if you set this very small, then you quickly uh, remove a lot of edges and then uh, it's hard, it's, it's easy to deal with, uh, with large graphs. If you set this, so it depends also on the, on, the, on the true underlying density and on how you tune this parameter. But uh, thousands, a few thousands are possible. Um, Okay. I think in at CMU they they have also very they have versions where they try to do a million variables or something, but I have not done that. Okay, thank you. Um, so you have uh, about ten fifteen minutes left. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So next is adjustment at the CP deck or the PAG level, right? So what do we mean by that? So here is an example of a CP deck. So I have two directed edges here and two undirected edges where, where you, we basically don't know in which direction they go. And there are three decks in this uh, Markov equivalence class which are given here. And now we would like to know, is there an adjustment set that works for all of these decks? And well, if you look at this first deck, then you would, there are two causal paths. So you don't need to adjust for anything though. So the only valid set is the empty set. But if I look at the second deck, then Z1 is a confounder between X and Y. So I need to adjust for Z1. And in the third deck, I need to adjust for Z2. So for every deck here, I need a different adjustment set and there is no adjustment set that works for all. So in this case, we, we would say there is not a valid adjustment set on the CP deck level. But here I have an example of a CP deck where we do have an adjustment set that works for any deck in its Markov equivalence class. So here, if you adjust for A and Z, then no matter how these blue edges are oriented, I have shown two examples here, um, we have a valid adjustment set. So how can we read off adjustment sets from a CP deck or from a PAC? And um, well, then we have the following theorem that Z is a valid adjustment set for a pair X, Y in, in a causal deck or a CP deck or a MAC or a PAC. 
if and only if the following three conditions hold. And now you cannot, uh, if, the, if you see these conditions for the first time, then, uh, then these are hard to parse, but I've kind of highlighted in blue what is different from the DAG setting. So we see we have one new condition that we call am amenability, uh, where we say that every proper possibly directed path from X to Y must start with a visible edge out of X. So that's a condition that doesn't have to do with the, with the specific ZZ that you're interested in, but just with the graph and X and Y. And then these other two conditions, they look very much like what we had for DAX, but because we have these undirected edges, we don't always know what descendants are. We don't always know if a node is a collider or not. And therefore we need these additional possible descendants, possibly causal path, definite status path, etc. But the idea is, is basically the same. And again, we can use these and this is also again implemented in this PCL R package. So if you give a, a pair X, Y and you give a graph and you tell us what kind of graph this is, if it's a PEG or a CP DAG or, or something else, then we can check if there exists a valid adjustment set at all. We can check whether a, a set Z that you want to use is valid and we can list all the valid adjustment sets. Here is an overview of um, results in this area. So um, the, the black marks here um, are sufficient conditions for adjustment and then the blue ones are necessary and sufficient. And so basically um, what is maybe the, the bottom line is the nicest is that we have a necessary and sufficient criteria now for DAX, MAX, CP DAX and PAX. And we also have this again for CP decks with background knowledge uh, as well. Okay, so now the final part that I want to talk about is about um, efficiency considerations. So maybe, maybe shall I just continue or shall we pause for questions? I think that in the interest of time, it, it, it's best for you to continue and we might raise questions up at the end if we have time. Okay, okay great. Okay, so now we have all these possible valid adjustment sets that we can use, right? And now what set should we use for statistical precision? And, and we define this in terms of what is the set that yields the optimal asymptotic variance of the causal effect that we're interested in. And now um, we focus on, on linear models uh, to answer these questions and on DAX and CP DAX, and also CP DAX with background knowledge, but not on settings with hidden variables. And what we developed there is a graphical criterion for pairwise comparison of certain adjustment sets. So if you give two valid adjustment sets, then sometimes we can compare these and say which one is more efficient than the other. But we cannot compare all, uh, all possible sets. Um, we also have a variance reducing uh, pruning procedure. If you start with a valid adjustment set, then we can prune this set so we can remove some variables uh, while maintaining that it is a valid adjustment set and while improving the statistical precision. And then what is maybe the nicest thing is that we have an, an optimal adjustment set uh, of a very specific form. And here it's not so important to know exactly what this means, but, but it's a, a simple thing that you can read off from the graph. And if, there is, if this set is not a valid adjustment set, then no set is a valid adjustment set. So then there exists none. And if this one is a valid adjustment set, then it is the most efficient one among all the valid ones. So here is an example where we, um, uh, for this graph that I showed in the beginning. And in this case, this optimal set consists of Z2, Z4 and Z7. What is the intuition behind this optimal set? Well. Recall that we, we do in linear models, we in the end do a regression of Y on X and S, and we want to get at the coefficient of X, right? That's the causal effect estimate that we're gonna use. So what do we like? So when, when do we get a precise estimate for this coefficient of X? Well, if, if S explains a lot of variance of Y, right? Because then we have a, a small statistical error in this model, basically a small Sigma squared, which will make everything more precise. And we would like S to have a small correlation with X because otherwise we get the variance inflation uh, problems. And that is basically what this optimal set does. So it, it, uh, it gives information on Y as much as possible and tries to kind of stay away from X as much as possible. 
But now if you think of this IDA method, then there we use the parents of X, right? And in terms of this intuition here, the parents of X is kind of the worst thing you can do because you get a lot of correlation with X and uh, you do not necessarily explain a lot of the variance of Y. So then when I, uh, talk to people about this, then people often ask, why don't we simply use the parents of Y? Right? Because of course the parents of Y, they explain a lot of variants of Y and uh, if X and Y are kind of far apart, then hopefully they're not correlated with X either. And this is not possible in general because it's generally not a valid adjustment set. So for example, in this case, the parents of Y are Z5, Z2 and Z7, but I'm not allowed to use Z5. Right? This was one of the forbidden nodes and, and, and I'm blocking this whole path if I use Z5. So now you may think, okay, yes, of course, you're not gonna use a mediator like Z5, but then Z2 and Z7, if I remove Z5, is, is not efficient because if I include Z4, then I um, explain some more variance in Y without getting correlation with X. So this will be more efficient in this case. But this intuition of this parent set of Y is, is, uh, is still nice. And with Janine Witte and Vanessa Didele and Leonard Henkel, we then um, have this reformulation of the set O. And I do it here for, for DAX. So what we do is we obtain a, for, a, a so-called forbidden projection DXY of our DAG by marginalizing out the forbidden nodes. So in this example over here, the forbidden nodes are Z5, Z6, and Z8 that I wanna marginalize out. And if I do that, I get this graph on the right. So there are simple rules to do this. So here, there's a path from Z4, Z5 to Y is a directed path. And if I then marginalize out Z5, then I get a directed edge from Z4 to Y in this uh, graph here. So in general, this would be an, an uh, acyclic directed mixed graph because I can also get bidirected edges here. And now in this graph over here, we basically do have that the parents of Y where you have to remove X and Y itself, of course, are, is the optimal adjustment set. So this is exactly the same as, as the O set that we found before. So this intuition that people have of using the parents of Y works after uh, doing this forbidden projection. And this forbidden projection is actually nice because it preserves all the valid adjustment sets that we had before. So you preserve all the information basically that's relevant for adjustment. So then you can think, well, what happens if I use this O set in the IDA method, this optimal set? And here on the left, so here are some simulation results where I look at uh, the relative mean squared error of optimal IDA, which uses this O set, divided by the mean squared error for local IDA, which uses the parent set. And so on the left side here, we, we have uh, NS100 and then the, the the other three columns here are for NS1000 and I have the D is different degrees of the uh, average degrees of the graph and then the size of the graph is on the is down here from 10 to 100. So basically the message of this left part here is when we use the true CP deck then optimal IDA tends to be more efficient than uh, local IDA. And that's not so surprising because it's kind of the way as, it's kind of like that by, by definition, right? If you use an estimated CP deck, then this difference becomes less clear. So for NS1000 here, you still see it a little bit that, that the mean and this, uh, the median and the geometric mean, I think are a little bit below one, but, um, but for NS100, it's not, the difference is not so clear anymore. So the problem here is that, that it's hard to estimate these CP decks. And if you get these wrong, and this, this optimal set O depends on kind of, a, it's not very local. It depends on causal path and parents of causal paths. If you get one edge wrong, then you might get your O set wrong and then it's not so efficient anymore. So, so there we see that, that if, if you're in a setting where it's very hard to estimate the graph, then you might as well just use the, the, the parents of X maybe. But if you can estimate it well, then using O is much better. So that's basically what I wanted to say more or less. So this is an overview of what I did. So I first did this IDA method for, for getting multi-sets of possible causal effects. And then we did this adjustment directly on the CP deck or the PAC level. And then I discussed some efficiency considerations that can be used in, in either one of these uh, parts one or two. And in general, I kind of 
try to focus on, on practical scalable methods with some statistical guarantees like consistency or efficiency. And of course, these do not uh, replace randomized controlled trials in any way, right? So we're just trying to use the observational data uh, as much as possible and then see this kind of as a input for uh, validation experiments. Um, there's some related work. I think Daniel may talk a little bit about this, this first one here. I also, that's basically going away from this linear model a bit and, and uh, looking at non-parametrically adjusted estimators of interventional means. And then also the OSET is optimal there in, in, uh, in some sense. And here are some open problems. Um, maybe I just mention the first one. So an, another way that you can use all these different valid adjustment sets that we have is you could estimate a causal effect using all these different valid adjustment sets. And if your model is correct, then all these estimates should come out roughly similar. So if you see a huge spread here, or, or you see that, that, um, that these estimates are, are not coherent, or, or then this is a, a red flag uh, and means that you might have some model misspecification. Then I think I stop here. So many papers are on my website and these R packages, PCL and Degati, they have everything implemented. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Malus. It was very clear. Um, we're now going to switch over to the discussion. We will have Dan Malinsky uh, present some slides. And then afterwards, uh, if we have time left, we'll allow for some more questions. And Malus can also quickly answer to the discussion. All right, uh, Dan. OK, let me just uh, share my screen. Can you see slides OK? Yes. Great. Great. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks to Marlus uh, for a wonderful talk and to the organizers for putting this together and inviting me. Um, I'm happy to be giving this discussion briefly in firstly, because I'm just a big fan of this whole line of work. Um, but also on a slightly more personal note, this is kind of one of Marlis's early paper, the one from 2009 that, that she mentioned was in some ways my own personal gateway into causal discovery research. Uh, I think my very first uh, causal inference research paper that I did in grad school was like a direct follow up to, to that work. And so it was kind of what got me uh, excited in this world. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about a lot of things which Marlis knows very well, but it just sort of hopefully give, give uh, the audience a kind of lay of the land about um, directions in which this research program can go and what are the uh, in principle challenges versus in theory challenges and so forth. Um, so I think that the, what, this work is super important because it spans these two tasks, which are often tackled separately in often separate literatures, the task of model selection or model specification, causal discovery, and the estimation of treatment effects, average treatment effects or total treatment effects. Um, and simultaneously, so, 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 the, so the work of IDA and related, uh, related ideas sort of addresses these two complementary questions that come up in these different research communities. On the, on the one hand side, there's all this theory that exists about identification or estimation of causal effects when you're given a known causal graph. But uh, an immediate question that always arises, especially if you say like teach this kind of material to an, a new audience is where, where's the graph supposed to come from? And there are cases of course where it comes from uh, study design or experimental design, but in this observational data world, uh, we want it to come as much as possible, uh, at least in, in hope uh, from, from the data itself. And then this flip side question about there's been, you know, now I guess 30 years or so of work on algorithms for learning causal graphical models from data, but um, it's often quite unsatisfying to just learn a thing, learn a pretty picture and present it. You want to do something with it. And so what, what, is, a, what is a practical use you can put uh, these algorithms to? And the one answer given by this line of research is, is uh, for estimating causal effects um, and informing your estimation. So I'm going to talk about uh, kind of three directions 
uh, or topics of research uh, related to this work. First, on semi-parametric or non-parametric approaches. Uh, and then I'll talk about allowing for unmeasured confounding. And then finally, moving beyond uh, backdoor adjustment or covariate adjustment and using complete causal identification machinery developed, um, specifically the ID algorithm. But there's many more topics and directions, which I won't unfortunately get a chance to talk about. So on the first, uh, on the first side, uh, Marlus and her co-authors focused mostly on linear settings. Uh, they were using tests of vanishing partial correlation in their structure learning part and using linear regression, ordinary least squares, in their causal effect estimation part. But neither of these tasks, neither the structure learning nor the causal effect estimation, really must be limited by linearity. In particular, the sort of like classic structure learning methods that Marlus mentioned, the uh, uh, PC algorithm, greedy equivalent search, and FCI, are in principle non-parametric, that meaning that there are at least point-wise consistency guarantees that require only uh, abstract assumptions or conditions on the inputs to those algorithms. So Mar Marlus talked about the Markov and faithfulness assumptions. Those are pretty much always required, um, although you can weaken faithfulness in various ways. Um, but the sort of uh, statistical assumptions required as input to those procedures is usually something like you have a consistent test of conditional independence, meaning a test of conditional independence that for whatever kind of data you have will be valid, will have the right level and have some power. Um, or, will, or if you're using a score-based approach, people like to use the BIC score, but the reason people use the BIC score is because it satisfies certain abstract properties. Um, which you can define and which you can devise sort of more complicated scores to satisfy if you like. So there are non-parametric independence tests out there, in particular ones based on kernel smoothing, and there are generalized scoring criteria uh, out there which are also based on kernel ideas, um, which can be and have been combined uh, with structural learning algorithms like PC, GES, FCI, and so forth. There are some practical barriers and some theoretical limits to doing non-parametric causal discovery. Practical barriers is often um, the computational limitations. So kernel-based tests are uh, difficult computationally if you have large sample sizes or high dimensions. Um, actually, sample size tends to be worse than dimensionality in that case. Uh, there are theoretical limits. You can't be entirely non-parametric. Um, there's a nice paper recently by Shaw and Peters, which shows that you need to have some smoothness assumptions in order to get um, consistency results with non-parametric conditional independence tests. But this is, but in both cases, this is active areas of research, right? That there's that people are developing better and better non-parametric independence tests uh, and and scoring criteria for for causal discovery. Um, on the estimation side, there's this extensive literature on uh, efficient estimation of the average treatment effect in semi-parametric and non-parametric models. So the kind of usual setup that you see in uh, many statistics papers is that people are, are sort of trying to be non-parametric or semi-parametric from the get-go. They choose some reference treatment values. Maybe it's a binary treatment or and Marlos was talking about continuous valued uh, gene expressions, so you have to choose some sort of reference value. But people like to make, you know, these non-parametric assumptions that are common, the conditional ignorability uh, assumption, or, or, or equivalently that Z satisfies the backdoor criterion, and positivity. And under those, under those non, in that non-parametric model, you can, est it's common to estimate the average treatment effect using augmented inverse probability weighting, uh, AIPW which requires that the nuisance functions, your propensity score on the one hand, and your outcome regression be estimated at sufficiently fast rates. Uh, people have done lots of work about plugging in non-parametric or machine learning methods for estimating these nuisance functions, which under some conditions, you have to be a bit careful about things. You might have to do some sample splitting or impose some, uh, some more stringent assumptions about smoothness. Um, but as long as you're careful about it, you can be quite non-parametric or semi-parametric about estimating the average treatment effect. Which is where uh, some of the recent work that Marlus mentioned by um, Rotninsky and Smuckler uh, comes in. 
where they sort of use uh, ideas from semi-parametric efficiency theory uh, in combination with this work on uh, uh, backdoor sets in linear models to show that the optimal adjustment set identified uh, by, by this paper of Henkel and al. Um, remains optimal in the sense of having smallest asymptotic variance in a non-parametric setting, as long as you replace the ordinary least squares estimator with the appropriate non-parametric estimator, which is basically the augmented IPW or solving the efficient influence function in that non-parametric model. Um, so what that means is uh, a principled non-parametric and optimal in the sense of efficient uh, version of IDA is possible if you swap out the various components. So swap out partial correlation tests for non-parametric independence tests and swap out the ordinary least squares estimator for um, these more uh, non-parametric estimators that use say machine learning for estimating nuisances at the right rates. And then you could do this kind of non-parametric version of IDA. Um, I'd be curious to hear, uh, I haven't seen it actually implemented so I don't know if Marlis has tried it out on, in the PC alg package or not, but um, all the components are basically there. And as a footnote, I, I wanted to mention, and I'll get back to this in a second, that even more recently, there's been this flurry of cool papers recently, um, some work by Bhattacharya and, and co-authors develop an even more general semi-parametric efficient approach to estimating average treatment effects uh, in settings with hidden variables. I'm going to get back to that in a second uh, after talking about hidden variables for a bit. So clearly in uh, many, many settings uh, where we have observational data and not randomized experiments, uh, unmeasured confounding is a major concern and, and Marcus brought this up in her talk. Um, in the graphical models literature, systems with uh, hidden variables are typically represented by acyclic directed mixed graphs, ADMGs. So they're mixed because they have these um, bi-directed edges, double-headed arrows to represent unmeasured confounders or latent variables. And so a natural question is whether we can perform an IDA type procedure while allowing for arbitrary unmeasured confounding. Uh, and Marlis brought this up in, in her talk. Um, so this procedure, uh, LVIDA, latent variable IDA, is a straightforward generalization of, of, of this earlier IDA work, which says we're going to use a procedure for learning mixed graphs, in particular uh, the FCI or related procedure for learning an equivalence class of ancestral graphs, um, and then do a kind of uh, clever enumeration of all possible backdoor sets in that mixed graph setting. And so these PAG search algorithms, if, if, if the graph on the left-hand side is the ground truth and L is an unmeasured or latent confounder, um, FCI algorithm, at least in the asymptotic limit, will give you something like the, the structure on the right-hand side, where the circles represent a kind of ambiguity about whether there's tails or arrowheads lurking there. Um, and we can run a kind of IDA type logic on that new object. But as, as Marlis mentioned, the, this approach is, is in some sense quite conservative because algorithms like FCI and related are maximally agnostic about unmeasured confounders. They make no assumptions about how many unmeasured confounders there might be or how strong they might be or how many variables they might affect. Uh, they just allow for the possibility that there's unmeasured confounding everywhere. And this leads to this kind of conservatism because the average treatment, of, if you cannot rule out an unmeasured confounder between some pair of variables, then, uh, then the causal effect might be not identified or consistent with null or zero in many cases, which is what we saw in that application uh, to the genetics data that Marlis showed. Um, there are alternative approaches, as Marlis discussed, which somehow restrict the possible hidden structure, maybe limit the number or strength of hidden variables. Uh, which trades kind of stronger assumptions about hidden variables for stronger conclusions about causal effects, another way of going forward. And uh, I'll just skip over these slides very quickly, but I often find it helpful, especially for audiences not um, entirely comfortable with uh, hidden variable models and how we might learn them. What do we mean when we say that 
we are learning a hidden variable uh, model like a PAG or a MAG is that we're using conditional independence constraints to, in some cases, rule out latent variables altogether. So this is a kind of neat slide which shows that um, if you were in this situation where X and Y are confounded by some unmeasured variable L, um, but you have some additional variables Z1 and Z2, which uh, are in a, a certain kind of relationship to X in terms of independence constraints, you can actually distinguish between there being an L there or not uh, on the basis of conditional independence constraints. So if you look at the bottom left of the, of the slide, you see that for the no hidden variable model, there are some independencies which hold. And for the uh, hidden variable model, there are some independencies which are violated. And so you, we're using patterns of conditional independence among more than two variables to potentially rule out uh, unmeasured uh, variables altogether. And on the flip side, patterns of conditional dependence may also suggest to you that there are uh, latent variables or hidden variables lurking. For example, if this were the correct structure using deseparation facts, we see that um, the marginal distribution should satisfy this set of uh, conditional dependence constraints. And you could verify yourself that if I replace that latent variable with a directed causal edge between x2 and x3, that would imply a different set of constraints. And so you can, in some cases, distinguish between latent variables being present or absent on the basis of non-trivial patterns of conditional independence and dependence. And this leads us to, um, to ask the question of, okay, so if we're, if we're really going to entertain the possibility of hidden variable models in their full generality, um, we might be tempted to, uh, to venture beyond just covariate adjustment. So covariate adjustment is all you need in settings where you don't have any latent variables. Um, but in settings with latent variables, there are some causal effects which may be identified by means other than the backdoor adjustment formula. For example, Pearl's famous example of the front door adjustment formula says that if this was the causal structure, you can identify the interventional distribution um, as such, and you, if you try and parse out what this means, it's, it's not, it doesn't amount to just conditioning on some covariate, but actually a kind of non-obvious um, identification functional. And more generally, there's the ID algorithm, identification algorithm, um, which harkens back to work by Jin Tian and Yuta Pearl from 2002, uh, and then later proved to be complete and modified in various ways by by other authors, by Ilya Spitzer, Thomas Richardson, Jamie Robbins, Robin Evans, where they, um, where completeness here means in the sense that uh, the idea algorithm tells you that whether a causal functional is identified, non-parametrically identified from a given ADMG, um, and it's an if and only if relationship. So, uh, some causal functionals may be identified by backdoor, but some may be identified by other non-obvious means. And the ID algorithm kind of covers the whole space of possibilities. So you know that if the ID algorithm says it's not identifiable, then it really is not identifiable non-parametrically at all. And so this leads to the kind of research question of can we learn, since we have this theoretical machinery for ADMGs, can we uh, learn an equivalence class of ADMGs uh, more generally uh, to, and use the ID algorithm to estimate causal effects that are not identified by uh, covariate adjustment? The answer to that is a kind of um, sort of in the sense that uh, there's different approaches you might take to this research question. The first is say that we already know how to learn mags and pags using the FCI algorithm or similar. So you could imagine learning a PAG using FCI and then enumerating the class of ADMGs that are independence equivalent or observationally equivalent to that PAG you just learned. And there actually is a procedure for doing so in this paper by Subramani. Um, and then run the ID algorithm on each resultant ADMG. Unfortunately, this is infeasible for large graphs, both because the set of um, 
ADMGs represented by a PAG can be quite huge. Uh, so if you have more than you know, five or six or eight variables, you're running into the hundreds or thousands of, of ADMGs in the equivalence class very quickly. And it's also expensive to try and run the ID algorithm independently on every graph in that class. Alternatively, uh, we would like to be able to select an equivalence class of ADMGs more directly by designing something kind of like FCI, but operating in the space of ADMGs. And there has been some relevant work on this, um, but mostly there's a lot of open problems to be solved. The, to summarize a kind of complicated set of issues, the, the general problem is that we don't have, there's no nice characterization of the equivalence class of ADMGs by a single object, like a PAG or CPDAG. Um, equivalent ADMGs can be quite different from each other. Uh, and so without having that object kind of theoretically characterized, it's not obvious how to do, how to design a search procedure, which is both general in the sense that it places no restrictions on the unmeasured confounding, consistent in the sense of asymptotic consistency and scalable to moderate or high dimensions. Uh, so that is currently an open research question. Um, so a kind of dream or aspiration for this line of work, because I think it is uh, really cool and worth uh, generalizing as much as possible, is to go non-parametric, uh, a non-parametric procedure, which is consistent and scalable and agnostic about hidden variables for selecting an equivalence class of ADMGs, combined with a kind of IDA type logic where you don't need to brute force enumerate the entire equivalence class and do uh, the ID algorithm on each one, but rather be clever about it in the way that the ID algorithm is. And finally, use semi-parametric efficient estimation of causal effects from the ID algorithm for your actual estimation step at the very end. And some recent work, the recent work I mentioned earlier uh, by Bhattacharya and colleagues uh, goes a long way because they have a kind of semi-parametric approach to say, taking a given ADMG and estimating a causal effect uh, from that graph. So um, I'll end there and just gesture super briefly to some other related topics which uh, don't have time to get to. Um, Marlous mentioned valid post-selection confidence statements uh, following graph selection, I think is an uh, important question and uh, kind of tricky because graph selection is this discrete procedure. Um, selecting possible instrumental variables and using IV techniques is another related question because um, uh, as you can, as you might have seen from some of the slides earlier, the sort of role of a lot of covariates ends up looking very similar to the role that instrumental variables plays. And then we could potentially identify and estimate some causal effects even when they are uh, confounded uh, using IV type procedures. And then uh, using algebraic bounds on causal effects. So I'm thinking here of the bounds by people like Mansky and Balky and other uh, authors um, who have come up with uh, algebraic techniques for bounding causal effects when confounding cannot be ruled out among some pairs, um, which is another kind of subroutine you might add to this kind of uh, research program. So I'll conclude there. Thanks very much to Marus and the organizers for having me. Fantastic. Thanks, Dan, for the great discussion. We're really running out of time, but perhaps quickly, Marus, do you want to respond to the discussion uh, thank you very much then for uh for the nice words and also for the for so i share your dream uh, on where this maybe could go i think not so easy to get there um but uh, but we can work on it and step for step uh, go in that direction um maybe one thing uh, that emma also wrote in the chat that that there is now this id algorithm for packs right so you could do try to learn a pack and then apply the id algorithm there if you're not interested in a multi-set of possible causal effects, but, but only in the identifiable ones. Um, and maybe you mentioned in the very end, you mentioned this uh, instrumental variable uh, or the selection of instrumental variables, basically. And uh, Leonard Henkel uh, is actually doing some interesting work on that, on, on finding 
efficient combinations of conditional instrumental variable sets. Uh, so that is uh, that should come out relatively soon, hopefully. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks again for uh, great. for the great discussion. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thank you. All right, it's now slowly time to uh, to wrap up. So uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Malus, for the fantastic talk. Also, thank you, Emma Perkovic and Leonard Henkel for rocking Q and A today. We think we're having like seventeen or eighteen questions that you answered. It might be a new record. Um, yeah. Then uh, also thank you, Dan, uh, for uh, for a great discussion. Uh, learned a lot. Now, next week, we have Caroline Euler from MIT. We're all looking forward to the talk. Until then, we hope you all stay safe. Thanks for joining and hope to see you all next week. Thanks. <laughs>